Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 16th, 2019. This is a week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I think the market remains a show, and I'll get into that in just one second. So current market conditions is very important. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in too bad, keep the questions related to the slides, and we'll get to the live charts today fairly quickly so you have time to ask other questions there. If it's an answer that requires a lot of thought, I will cover it in the next Q&A session, which will be next Wednesday. Hold off on your stock picks, your favorite stock picks, until we get to the live charts. And then once we're there, and this is for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time so I know what I covered and what I did not. All right, what are we going to focus on? Well, charts and the charts, though. What a concept. I want to spend a little time updating the 10% system, and I have a couple little things I want to add to it. And there's uh, some gleamings this week, and uh, I actually created a little indicator on the fly, and that's probably why it takes me so long and I'm always a little bit late to get started with these. I'll always go off on a tangent of research or whatever right before. And I guess the big question is, is winter still coming? Now, I want to do a quick update on the TFM system. And like I said last week and weeks prior, it's a really, really simple system, but even I get a little tripped up in the presentation of it. And that's kind of like exhibit A. Maybe just don't present it well. But I think it shows how difficult it is to trade even something simple. And that's this is a exhibit A as to why you should focus more on simple systems and create simple systems versus more complex ones. And we're not even getting into the psychology of it. The psychology of it is much harder to trade a more complex system. As I often say, you ask 10 different people for a wave count, you'll get 10 different wave counts. I always hate to say that because somebody's going to send me something nasty in their wave count and how perfect it is and whatever. <laughs> anyway, let me just zip through the rules real quick here. There is one thing that I left out last week, but you can go in and see prior presentations for a lot more on this and a lot more details. Basically, we're looking to buy the market when it is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high now that would be a little bit noisy so the whipsaw filter is that we also have two weeks where the where the lows are greater than the 50-week moving average in other words two weeks of landry light now this is a long only system although i think it does have some potential possibly on the short side but we're just going to focus on beating buy and hold with something really really simple and you want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high. And the close is less than the 50-week moving average. That's just a little whipsaw filter in there to keep you out of trouble, but not so constrictive as to keep you in the market and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until the market continues to tumble. So this is what it looks like. You notice the ribbon on the bottom is bullish. As long as we're within 10% of the 50-week closing high, and there's also Landry light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. Very simple concept. What amazes me, though, is these little simple concepts, not that I'm the grand poobah or anything, because other people have done similar things in the past. I always think I come up with something great, and I read a book written 100 years ago, and somebody's already talked about that. But anyway, something as simple as Landry light can help to keep you on the right side of the market. I've done plenty of presentations on that. But again, if you're within 10% of the 50-week closing high, and you have Landry light, the ribbon is bullish. It turns bearish when two things happen. One, you close below the 50 week moving average, and you are greater than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. So, this is just technical analysis 101, is the basis of this whole system. So, basically, I'm saying, all right, well, what is technical analysis 101, first and foremost? Well, technical analysis 101 states that in order for a market 
and I know, don't beat a dead horse here, but just hang, hang with me. If a market's at A and it's going to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to pass through B. On the flip side, if it's going to go back down to A, it's going to have to pass through B along its way back down to A. So in other words, if it's going to do a round trip, and let's just say B is whatever, you could put any prices you want in here, but let's just say 10, 15, and 20. Keep the math easy, okay? If it's going to go to C, it's going to have to pass through B. If it's going to go back down to A, make a round trip, it's going to have to pass back through B. So my theory here is, although I do have, by the way, I do have a an IPO pattern where you pretty much just buy it, B, and I'll, I'll hint at that a little bit. I'm not going to give you the whole system there, and that's out of courtesy for the people in my IPO course. But the point or the theory with this system is as long as you're somewhere near C, stay long, get long or stay long, and if you're near B on the downside, go ahead and get out. And the thinking is if a market's going to go beyond C, I'm not going to make the beyond C joke, then it will have to first near C, okay? So that's the whole system there. It amazes me. I'm ne it never ceases to amaze me, I should say, how such simple things can work in the market. It's funny. I woke up thinking this morning about a lot of the dichotomies of trading and more accurately, the paradoxes of trading. Trading, you only have to sell higher than you buy. Now, I didn't say buy low, sell high, because that's a loser's game. But if you are a trend trader, you just have to figure out where you're going to get on that trend and sell higher than you buy. And you look at these charts, and it's so damn easy, okay? Easy, easy, easy peasy. But when you're in a heat of battle, like right now, I've got a scream and alarms going off and stuff. And, this morning, and right before the show, I'm placing orders. And it's like it's not so easy from a psychological perspective perspective and that's kind of the thing that just, just really attracts me to it is this big dichotomy of it, it's a lot harder than it looks or the paradox however you want to look at that anyway this system just reminds me of how if you keep it really simple you could do okay now use the word okay I don't want to say that you have the holy grail here or with any other thing that I've that I've put out there but if you do follow something simple, you'll do okay, and longer term, you're going to win. Now, just to kind of wrap up the visuals on this simple little system, the last sell signal that we had back in November, notice that the ribbon went from bullish to neutral and then to bearish. The ribbon turns bearish when two things happen. One, you close below the 50-week moving average, and number two, you are greater than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. Now, let's say that the market goes 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high. That means it could be in trouble, but you're not quite below the 50-day moving average just yet, so then it goes neutral. Or if you don't have Landry light, it goes neutral on the upside. So right here, you can see the you had a bullish ribbon. Why? Well, this was less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, and then this went neutral. Why? Well, you begin to intersect that moving average. In other words, you no longer had daylight. The next week, what happened? Well, it went bullish again because up here, you're less than 10% away from the 50-week moving high, but you have daylight, okay? It, or I should say you also have daylight. So this was a spreadsheet we were looking at here. And when I updated it early this morning, one thing I noticed was that you've been in a market for quite a while, 76 days from this last signal, but you only made 2%. And what did the market do since the December lows? Well, it went up 25%. So you were a little late getting back in. And I'm going to flesh this out in a little more detail in a few minutes. But that was a pretty big run. And we're going to come back to that 25% quite a bit, especially when we get to the market analysis. But here's the last buy signal. You could see that the market was within 10% of all-time closing highs or 50-week closing highs. And the moving average or the lows of the price for two weeks were greater than the moving average. Now, what's kind of interesting about systems is I don't develop systems to 
trade in and of themselves, although I think it would be kind of fun, and I've been working with a few of you guys that, that agree with me or think it would be kind of cool to allocate a small portion of money just to see if you could continue to be buy and hold with something like this, just for kind of like SMGs. But the cool thing about it is I was pretty bearish when this thing turned bullish, and I was probably so bearish that I failed to recognize it was a signal. I didn't think we can get a signal from this for a long, long time. And somebody in the Facebook group pointed out that, hey, we got a signal. We got a buy signal in this TFM system. And I'm like, no, there's no way there's a buy signal. And lo and behold, when I pull it up, it's like, wow, there is. Now, this doesn't mean you go crazy bullish when you get a signal, but it, it's a piece of the puzzle that is revealed to you. So I come in sort of bearish, still bearish, and it's like my own system is triggering a bullish signal. So I need to think about this. Maybe I need to pull in my claws a little bit and not be so crazy bearish and pay attention to the price action and what's happening. Now, a couple of random thoughts that were left over from the last few weeks. Like death and taxes, some whipsaws can be avoided. There were only a couple of bum trades, though, over the last, I think, 30 years or however long I've plotted this out. I think it was 30 years. So, oh, here we go. And then there was only 10 trades total, which ain't too bad. And that's a, I'm not going to repeat the ain't too bad story. And, again, simple system can work. And buy and hold is hard to beat because this thing did beat buy and hold by about – 30% total, not 30% overall, 30% total. I think it was like 950 versus 980. But the big point is you avoid these big drawdowns. And I want to pick that apart just a little bit in just a minute. Now, again, as I've been saying quite a bit, there's no guarantees. But throughout the history of the market, at least looking back to the 1900s, early 1900s, I should say, Every big drop has started with a little job first. Now, it did get you out the Friday before the crash in 1987. Obviously, there's no guarantees that it will always do that, but so far, so good. Now, a couple of more random thoughts. Like I said last week, I'm not selling you on this system. In fact, it's free. <laughs> you know, Oprah, kind of like an Oprah system. You get a system, you get a system. But the point I'm trying to make is that something really simple can keep you out of a lot of trouble. Go on your grail hunt and, and read all these books and do all these indicators and plot all this crap. But then every now and then, just come back to a blank chart and then look at something really simple like this and just ask yourself, kind of like I woke up thinking this morning, like all you have to do is capture a movement in price. I know. A lot easier said than done. But that's all you have to do. Now, the thing that I noticed, because we're only up 2%, and the market itself is probably, I think it's probably up around 25% now. So I'm sorry, 22 or 3%. We'll look at that in one second. But it is a little slow to catch up if you have that V-shaped type correction versus the bear market. So the last little slide we had, I don't think we went far enough to call it a bear market, at least by the media's definition. And then we had that big, sharp V-shaped recovery. Now. Before I talk about that much further, right before I went live, I came up with the idea, and, and I'm not the first person to have created this indicator, so I don't want to make it look like I just discovered the Holy Grail or something. But this is just a little indicator where I'm looking back 50 price bars, in this case it's 50 weeks, okay, to fit with the TFM system, and I'm plotting that. So this day here, if you went back 50 days, it would be 10% off of that closing high. And that'll make more sense in just one minute. But notice that when you have a bear market, and we'll zoom in on this, but notice that when the bear market drops for a long time and then bottoms out for a while, your entry based on this indicator, okay, you also need a Landry light too, but your entry based on this indicator begins to drop, so you're getting in at a lower level. And again, we'll zoom in on them in one second. But if you're up here and you have like a V-shaped recovery, that market drops quite a bit and the indicator doesn't catch up with it. In other words, the 90% of the closing high doesn't drop that much to catch up with the market because new lower closing highs aren't added in. All right, let me walk you through that. 
So let's go back to 2002, 2003. I'm such a nerd. I just think this is cool as heck, but maybe you guys disagree. What's the um, what's the old Tim Ferriss thing? Scratch your own itch. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm doing with this all this crazy stuff. All right. So if you come in here and obviously, let's just say if we look back in time, I'm pretty sure that was a 50 week closing high. So if you went 50 days ahead, then this line here is if you took this closing high and you multiplied it times 0.90, okay, 90% of that, or if you want to look at the flip side of it, 10% below that, okay, that's where this line would be. Now notice as the market begins to drop, because this is a moving target looking back 50 days, then eventually this begins to catch up. Now, if this market just had like a quick recovery, let's say this was the quote unquote low and it blasted straight back, back up, then you would miss the move from here all the way to here, okay? But notice what happened because this bear market went so long and then this doesn't look like a long time, but that's two years and I remember this. It just took forever for this market to bottom out. And that's why things with a little bit of lag. Oh, I got a thumbs up from Paul. Paul says chart nerds. Fantastic, Paul. <laughs> Good. There's two of us in here, at least. But that's why something with a little bit of lag, such as a moving average or any system for that matter, but especially something like a moving average, such as the weekly both side moving averages, caught up fairly quickly in 2003 because they had plenty of time to adjust to the lower level prices. So you're 90% away from. 50 week highs here. Okay. Now, if you just said, well, I'm going to do all time highs 90% away, well, then you'd be, you wouldn't get into way up here. Now, obviously, we went past that level, but there's no guarantee that that won't be the end of the trend. So you do want this thing to adjust to more current conditions. And you can see it's pretty cool the way it's worked out. And then you can almost just kind of say, well, as long as we're below it, stay short. As long as we're above it, stay long. But of course, that wouldn't have any whip, any whipsaw filters, and that's why I added in the whipsaw filters. Or I should say, the reason I added in the whipsaw filters is there will be blood, there will be whipsaws. And I know I say this ad nauseum, but like Greg Morris said when he visited a few years back, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So you can see what happened last time is that this indicator didn't have time to adjust because you had that v-shape recovery so this would be your 50 week closing high so if you went 50 days ahead one two three four five six seven eight. yeah so even like right here it's it still hasn't adjusted till right here so this thing never did adjust lower for the slide because you didn't have 50 days below this peak, okay? Now, should this turn, should this have turned into a bear market, then this indicator would have eventually began to catch up to price. All right, let's take a look at 2007. Now, 2007 didn't work out as great as 2002, 2003, because the bear market was fairly quick and the recovery was, recovery was fairly quick. So you could see that it did begin to check, catch up with price and had the price kind of meandered a little lower in here, it would have dropped and kept dropping and kept dropping in like 2003, would have been would have gotten you in much sooner. But even still, it still did pretty good getting you in fairly early for the next bull market. Now, as I hinted at a minute ago, the magna magnitude of declines after the sell-off is significant. So I'm not presenting the system for you to rush out and trade it, although maybe a few of us might dabble with it a little bit just for S and Gs. But I think the main thing that comes out of something like this, some really simple research, is as I said earlier, no guarantees, but it has kept you out of every bear market in history. And even that little recent slide in here was fairly significant. So you had a sell signal, you got out the way, the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So it will help to avoid these diaper change 
moments. And I think I stole that from Ian McActivy. He, to those of you who don't know Ian, he was part of the Canadian Gold Fund. I forget the name of it. And he was, uh, I don't know how you would describe him, but he was, he would give these fantastic presentations and you would laugh your ass off. I was sitting next to Greg Morris. And this is one of my first meetings with the AAPTA, and Ian got up there, and you know, Greg in the Southern draw is like, "You ever heard this guy before?" I'm like, "No, Greg." He goes, "Well, you're in for a real treat." <laughs> and he'll just—I I wish I could do uh, present in one tenth the the humor that this guy has. It's just his slides are amazing and funny as hell, and he's able to take statistics and economics and, and make them exciting, which was funny. Anyway, he used the term diaper change moments going through a lot of these stats. And obviously in 2000 and in 2007, the diaper change moments were pretty big. And if you go back to 2000, look at the NASDAQ when it lost 70 something percent of its value, that was certainly a pretty big diaper change type of moment. And as I often say, and it's kind of Greg Morse, Morse's line of reasoning too. A 50% drawdown is pretty bad if you are nearing retirement. And you know, if you got 20 million saved, man, you have to live with 10 million. You know, yeah, it's going to suck a little, but you'll be okay. But if you got a if you got a million saved, then you got to live off a half a million. Your lifestyle has changed dramatically. So that's the cool thing about something simple like this. And even the last little sell-off, you avoided 11% dip. Now, that's significant. I don't know if that's quite a diaper change. I consider a diaper change 30, 40, 50% or more. But I remember having a lot of friends and family call me back in November of 2018. And I'm a man on the street kind of guy. Now, I'm not sure. I've been, my website's been there for 20 years and they know what I do. I'm not sure why they don't bother reading me or watching an occasional weekend chart. I mean, I'm sure at some point, over the last 20 years, they've had trouble falling asleep, but and they could have just watched it then. Anyway, but I digress. But that's the man in the street type of thing. When people start to panic, and I was also selling my house around that time, and a lot of people, it was kind of a revolving door because we had a property that wasn't easy to sell. It's not easy to sell country property. Note to self, if you ever buy a house and you want to flip it, don't live in the country, although we did stay there 20 years, so I guess we did okay. Anyway, back then, a lot of people were very panicky, and they wanted to know. When they found out what I did, they'd go to my office and see all these studio lights and a green screen and screens everywhere and soundproofing everywhere and microphones and, like, what the hell do you do? It's like, when I tell them, they want to know, why is the market going down? I'm like, I don't know. Speaking of market going down, is winter still coming? For you Game of Thrones fans... You know, this is Jon Snow, that bastard Jon Snow. Well, he's been warning about winter coming for a long time. Now, I left this one in from last week just to illustrate the V-shaped recovery at a high level. And again, that was a 25% plus run. Markets rarely move 25% in an entire year, and we just did that since December. So we're very overbought. We are pushing into a potential double top, and as, as I said quite often, you don't want to trade directly off of classical technical analysis, but learn it and see if you get a setup maybe within it, like a bow tie, as I'll show you in just one second, at the market that's coming off of something like a double top. That might be something that you want to pay attention to. Speaking of bow ties, take a look at the S&P 500 on a daily chart. Last time we did have a bow tie was back in uh, October of 2018. And when they occur off of all-time highs, as I preach, it pays to pay attention. If you get a weekly one off of all-time highs, then pull in your horns, honor your stops, GTFO. <laughs> Sometimes it can get pretty ugly pretty quick. Well, you don't have the GTFO, you just have to let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. And one thing that's kind of cool that I recently wrote about in my now column is that by accident, I happened to notice that I was 90% cash. It's not like I have everything all plotted out where I know exactly how much equity I have or how much in equities I have and because it, it, it comes and goes. I might get stopped out one day, I might trigger in the next day. 
triggered into one this morning. So now it's like it, it, it fluctuates, right? <laughs> Reminds me, one of my wife's friends, she's a, this was supposed to go into layman's guide to trading stocks, but my editor took it out. He said it was sounding like a jerk. He, he wasn't so kind. He called me another word. But uh, she's real sh short and small. And so I guess it doesn't take much. So she stopped over for whatever reason, return a dish or whatever. And uh, she had a couple of glasses of wine. And, I, and I'm and i very emotional kind of guy. I, I'm not a, I probably wouldn't be a good poker player, although I've played a little bit here and there. I'm, I'm really not that good at it because probably because I'm, I'm easy to read. And so she's like, she goes, oh, it looks like you had a bad day. And I said, yeah, the market kind of whacked me a little bit. And she said, well, markets will fluctuate. So I thought that was kind of a, true statement anyway before i digress too far we do have a bow tie in the process of forming in the s p 500 after all time highs now last time that was kind of scary and this time as i said a second ago it could be happening off of a double top take a look at drugs they bow tied down off of major highs i think that's all time highs and they slid a little bit out of that bow tie as you can see Manufacturing, another one of those areas could be bow tying soon. Notice that it overshot that prior high just a little bit. And as I've said in weeks past, sometimes a, a double top will overshoot and that traps people on the wrong side of the market. And sometimes it will undershoot, meaning it'll stall short of the prior peak. And that also traps people in because a lot of times people think, well, it looks like it's going to new highs. Why should I sit around and wait for new highs and get in early? So I'll get in early to beat the beat the system. Metals and mining not rolling off of all-time highs, but multi-month highs, bow tying down, downtrend nonetheless. Now, a lot of areas, as you would expect, have taken on the appearance of the overall market. So you can see retail kind of looks a lot like the S&P 500. Potential double tops potential double top in the works, potential bow tie in the works. Same thing goes for the trannies. A little bit wide and loose, but just made all-time highs a few weeks back or a month or so ago, and now beginning to bow tie down off of all-time highs. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes a market will stall short of the prior peak and that actually traps some people in because that means the people who got in a little early thinking it would get to that prior peak, they might turn around and bail out. And you could see that computer hardware, otherwise known as Apple, has a bow tie down. And again, it didn't quite make it to that prior peak. Now, speaking of Apple, it's funny. It's like whenever Apple drops, people are just so in love with this stupid stock can't do any wrong anything wrong well one day it will okay but it's interesting it's like a couple days ago I saw somebody made a post is it time to buy Apple it's like no <laughs> you know you got a big ugly gap down and it could bow tie down and then bigger picture wise it stalled well short of its prior peak so I'll probably be proved wrong on that one because Apple just tends to defy gravity but that'll work until it don't now, all isn't bad in the world. I just want to throw this one in. This is software. So far, it looks pretty darn good. You can see the bow ties beginning to roll over a little bit, but nothing to worry about just yet. In fact, it still looks fairly bullish to me. Now, getting back to the downside, there's a lot of people like to like to look at the semis, and that goes way back to, I guess it's RIA and Dow Theory. I've read all these things some of which I remember, some of which I find useful. But I'm not saying that Dow theory is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just in more recent times, I like to look at the semiconductors for confirmation with the overall market. And you go back a few weeks or maybe a month or so, and the semis were doing pretty good, banging out brand new highs. So I felt a little better about the overall market. But now the semis beginning to break down and notice that now they're beginning to bow tie down. Now, I like to look at a lot of charts every day and I don't separate out the ETFs. So I make sure I see those ETFs while I'm flipping through all the charts. 
And one thing I've noticed is a lot, I'll get excited, like, oh, what is this? This is going to be the mother of all bow ties. Look at this beautiful bottom after this long, long downtrend. I mean, this is textbook bow tie, textbook first thrust type of setup. I'm all over this chart. And then I'll look and see that, oh, it's the inversed shares. Now, it doesn't mean that it might not be an opportunity in inverse shares, but keep in mind, it's very dangerous to hold these inverse shares longer term. And I'm going to explain that a few more in a few minutes. The thing to gleam is by seeing the inverted chart. And years ago, I had a little, uh, my system thinks it's a virus, so I don't have it on anymore. But it was called Flip or something, and it's, it's a joke. For those of you who work in the office, you download this little flip thing and you push a button and their screens flip upside down while somebody's in the bathroom or at the lunch. They come back and they think their computer's totally fried or WTF. But anyway, I used to use it on the fly. I had a key, a macro programmed. So if I wanted to see the flip side of something, I would just hit the key. And sometimes it will help you gain some perspective. And that's one thing that's good about these, these inverse funds, at least over the short term looking at things it can help you to gain some perspective so these inverted cues look pretty bullish which means what it means cues or bearish now you have to resist the temptation to take a flyer let's go back to this chart hey it's 950 a share oh, i could buy a thousand shares less than ten thousand bucks and forget about it market crashes i'm gonna do fantastic well the problem is if that doesn't happen sooner, if that doesn't happen sooner than later, then it's the decay is going to eat away at you. And the other thing that will happen is the decay problem is that the if the market does begin to drop, then these funds have to reinvest their money at the lower levels. At, they have to short at lower levels, and it creates a bit of a kind of a martingale effect there's not enough time to get into all the details of that but once you start studying these etfs you'll learn that there are some nuances like that plus if it's also leveraged the track and error gets exacerbated anyway but you might be thinking well let's buy some of this etfs because they're cheap and they can only go up well the problem is they'll reverse split you to death so if you actually look at like a monthly on these inverted shares you can see it goes up to three thousand and the point is they eventually all go to zero. The inverted ones, that is, will all eventually go to zero. So hopefully that made sense with the inverted ETFs. Now, let me interview myself. Do I trade them? Yes. Do I hold them longer term? No. Do I hold them overnight? I try not to. I just try to go in and capture the opening gap reversal type of trade. So something like that SQQQ, if you come in and the market's up really big overnight, take a look at those inverted shares and look for a possible shorting opportunity off of that opening gap reversal. Oh, the other thing too, just, just a quick FYI, if you're really, really bored, you can read the prospectus on these things, and especially those short ones. And they basically are just the goal, at least, and, and as I learned from Greg Morris, whatever the prospectus says, these companies have to do. But their goal is to tr track the daily price change, invert the daily price change on the invert share, inverse shares. So that's a big problem with your tracking error. It's not like if the market goes down 10% over 10 weeks, they're trying to match that 10% over 10 weeks. They're just looking to capitalize on that one day's trading. And then that helps to add into all the tracking errors and shorting errors. And I get a little tripped up trying to wrap my head around everything, but I just know that the fact that they have to keep shorting at lower levels, the fact that it's a day over day price change only and not longer term, along with other factors, creates a lot of that decay so to speak, or tracking errors, if you prefer, in those funds. Now, like I said last week, the Rusty remains a rub, a big V-shaped recovery, tight or I should say a big retrace at high levels. Tried the breakout last week, and this week it came right back in. 
Okay, any questions on the overall market? We're going to get to the charts here in just one second, so uh, we could certainly come back to the indices or sectors or whatever. Now, I did want to spend a little time talking about in search of trends like a good little trend following moron. Last year, I traded some weed stocks. The year before that, I was heavily in the Bitcoin. And my goal is to find trends. That's my job. As a friend of mine said years ago, this was even before I was in this business, but he knew I was into trading heavily. He said if they found out that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would start buying hypodermic needles. Well, that's not exactly true. Drug use isn't on the rise, is it? <laughs> well, the chart would have to be going up too on needles. Anyway, in search of trends like a good trend following more on, here is the Bitcoin trade that it took a while back. I also had similar trades in Litecoin and Ethereum based on similar patterns. But just wanna show you what my entries, my money management, and my trailing stop. Now, this is where I got in. The other chart I used looked a little bit different, but Bitcoin was trading around 3,600 at the time. I've blacked out my size because some half of you, if you saw it, would laugh, and then the other half of you would ask me for a loan. So, <laughs> but that's a, that's the that's the actual snapshot of the entry, and then within about a week or so, that's where I sold half, and I was looking for about a five or six hundred dollar gain, and I think five hundred dollars probably per contract and that's where I decided to go ahead and sell half and at that point I moved my stop to break even with discretion now I didn't actually have a hard stop in I think at one point I had a hard stop in and you know these brokerages that's the big scary part these exchanges or brokerages we're going to call them they change your rules quite often so the Bitcoin trading in and of itself would be it's no different than trading Forex or stocks or gold or whatever commodities but it's the, the the rub, I guess, so to speak, is in these exchanges. I, extra, I trust these exchanges as far as I can throw them. That's why I'm not putting my life savings into Bitcoin. But as a trend following more, and I just can't resist myself. So anyway, I, I think I did have a hard stop in. I no longer use hard stops, but they did change the rules and took my stops out for whatever reasons. But anyway, they, it did. It depends on what chart you look at too, and that's the other thing I'm going to show you in one second. And that's the other thing that's a little tricky with this Bitcoin is it depends on, like I said, the chart I used in my last column came from a different source, and it actually had nicked the stop. And this one looks like it's just right at that stop. But I did remember either going slightly in the minus column or pretty darn close to it on my second low for the trade. And I remember thinking that, okay, I might have to bail out on this. I don't want the trade to turn into a loser overall. If it just turned into a swing trade, that's fine. But I don't want to lose everything. And that's why I use the word discretion. Because I do remember it got close. It might have went slightly negative. But I don't know for a fact. And then ever since, I've been trailing a stop higher. So that was, what, February 16th. So now we're, what, March, April, May almost May okay so that's almost three months we're closing in on three months and that's how it works as a trend follower we take the swing trade just in case nothing else materializes and then we stick with half of the position longer term now in plotting this chart this morning and again this is from a different source than the brokerage but I noticed that there's a, a spike down and I don't remember this spike down if anybody trades crypto let me know luckily I was able to survive that spike down and I think it was just a bad tick. And I don't know if that was legit or not. But then so far, you can see just trailing a stop higher. So the point of that is just a simple Dave Landry trend following pullbacks. I didn't invent the pullback. Money management, simple money management can get you into trending markets. So... Like I said a minute ago, the weed stocks were hot a while back. Weed stocks might be lighting up again, so we might go after those. Um, whatever, there's there's you know, 5G, oh, 5G, you know, that's a big deal now. So we'll just have to see how it shakes out and 
play those stocks from a trend follower's perspective. All right, I need to beat the dead horse a little bit on money management. I know, I know I've used this example recently, but I want to show you one more time. Now that it's banging out new lows with vigor, this was a buy at B. We got in on day five. This is actually one that I mentioned in the Facebook group. If you are a member of DaveLander.com, if you're a gold member, that is, or if you're on the trading service, which means you get the gold free, then please join the Facebook group. My ultimate goal with all this is to create a mastermind group. And I think the Facebook group is a bit of a glimpse into that goal of that mastermind group because I've already picked up quite a few stocks from you guys talking about them that have went into my own portfolio and I've done quite well on them. So thank you for that. Now you can see we took half profits on this TIGR. Begin to take off. I got pretty excited. And then it came right back in and stopped me out. Now, overall, as I've said quite a bit, I ended up making 3% on this trade over a couple of weeks. And even though I made three, I, I did not practice what I preached because I began to drop multiple F bombs when I got stopped out of it. But you know what? 3% on an overall account is much better than a, a poke in the eye. Now, the other thing to remember here is obviously it wouldn't work without money management. But remember, sometimes, as I often say, these IPOs will fly and then they'll die. You can make a lot of money in that fly phase. Now, I was hoping, I know you shouldn't say hope, but I was hoping this thing was a blast up to 50, 60 bucks a share. And it happens, not that often or not often enough, I should say. But it can happen. These things just get squeezed higher and they just go parabolic and it's just a wonderful ride. Unfortunately, this one came right back in. But notice that it's now about half the value or nearly half the value of where I originally got in. So without any money management, you would have lost half of whatever you put up on this trade. So again, I hate to beat the dead horse on money management, but it's important. All right, again, so if you are a gold member, join the Facebook group. It's on the top menu under the members area. And I will approve you. And if I don't approve you right away, message me and say, Dave, I am in the Facebook group. Yeah, I'd be happy to, Brad. We'll get to that in just one second. So anyway, Facebook's great. I, I totally missed the pins trade, okay? I was watching it. And I can't say whether or not I would have caught it, but it definitely woke me up. When John Zintinsky pointed out that pins was setting up, and that was a nice little trade. So that's the point there. So I'm I'm nerdy and I'm biased, but I'm pretty excited about this members area. And my ultimate goal again is to create a mastermind group. And I could check your progress, or more importantly, you could check your progress by seeing what courses you've completed and how much. And obviously, if you're having some psychological problems in your trading if you're not honoring your stop or following your plan so i don't feel like i can go into on a swatch in there not following you not honoring your stop or following your plan trading when you anger into life <laughs> those things then you it if we come in here and look at the course progress and we see that you haven't completed the trading psychology or the mindset course then maybe you need to focus some efforts there anyway i'm pretty nerdy but that's the members area, so check it out. And so far, I've been really excited about this. It's a, The feedback has been phenomenal, and I've really struck a chord with a few of you. So, Okay. I think I've kind of beat the dead horse on the market. From a micro perspective, obviously, NASDAQ, decent day there, too, so far. Let's take a look at the P's, and we'll take a look at the Rusty, too. S&P 500, decent day. You know, maybe we, we dodged a bullet with all this, you know? But I think that when the market begins to stall after just making new highs, especially when it's a double top and you got a bow tie in the works, I think it pays to pay attention. Certainly you want to honor your stop. Again, you don't have to take any drastic action like I've been talking about quite a bit. And we spent a lot of time talking about this last week in the Q&A. You're not necessarily taking drastic ac action. You're just doing what you always do and letting the ebb and flow control your portfolio, you're also becoming a little bit more selective on new positions and not chasing everything out there. Okay, question is B, Y, and D. Now, I may have confused the issue with facts on this one <laughs> because it's fake meat. Am I correct on that? Who in this group 
Somebody in the Facebook group said they actually tried it and it was pretty good. Are you in here today? So I, I don't like to confuse the issue with facts, but when I see an $80 IPO, it was John, okay. John said he tried it. It was good. What's it taste like? Chicken? So just me, to me, it just seems like, I don't know about this. It's fake meat, fake meat made out of, uh, it's ground beef and it's made out of, it's made out of vegetables, made out of beets. Ugh. I don't know about that. Like the, uh, what did I just write about recently? The, uh, the old lady and the old men and the Alexa silver ads. I don't know about that, but okay. First of all, buy it be as a general statement. I like to go after buy it be setups when they are less than $20 a share. And that's just an observation from a lot of empirical research. It just seems like if they're less than $20 a share and you're buying that new closing high, there's a good chance for them to continue higher. Now, it doesn't mean that I won't consider an IPO over 20 bucks. There's a couple of caveats. One, what I might do is let it establish itself a little bit further and take a secondary type of setup. So a pioneer setup, you can get in as low, as quick as day five, okay? And with something like the, and I don't have a name for this, so we need to name this, but if I add a five-day moving average to the chart, and this is yet another little simple system that I came up with just to prove a point, and the point was that can you can I come up with something simple that would get you into good IPOs and keep you out of bad ones? And something that was so I don't want to say mechanical, but so obvious that I could point to it and say, okay, you would have avoided Uber or Lyft or you know Blue Apron or whatever. And I came up with this right around the time Snapchat was coming public because it seemed like a stupid company to me. But the rules for that. And if you go in the members area under the IPO section, under methodology, and if you have the IPO course, um, you'll learn a lot more about IPOs. But anyway, the rules are pretty simple on that. Landry Light, low greater than the five-day simple moving average. That's it. Plus, new closing high like right here. Now, there's no priced characteristic on this one because, and see the article that I just republished on Uber, which should be on my website on the free stuff. But the point is that there's the two rules are one five day moving average. And so that means you can't trade to day six at least. And number two, new closing high. Now, when you add in that daylight or Landry light, I should call it now, that means when the market's closing at a new high and you have Landry light, you have momentum and confirmation. Confirmation is a new high, and then you have some momentum or acceleration, whatever you want to call it, by being above that low. So technically, yesterday's close would have been a buy on this one. I did not go after it. It just seems a little too crazy, even, even though I trade some really crazy stuff. But I let it go. It, 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 that's hard. I have a problem with with FOMO, especially if it's my own gosh darn pattern okay <laughs> especially when i see you guys in the facebook group taking my stuff and making money with it and sometimes i'm left behind okay i used to joke once years ago some guy took my stuff and sort of trading these really micro cap stocks or small cap stocks and absolutely printed money and as i joked it's kind of like somebody stealing your bike off your front porch and then riding around the block when they get in front of your house they pop a wheelie you know <laughs> so that's part of my fear of missing out is like, I don't want to miss a lot of these issues, but in a case like this, I had to really sit on my hands and just let it go. But yeah, absolutely. It triggered, technically it triggered yesterday on the close. I did not go after it. It just seems a little crazy to me. And usually I don't confuse the issue with facts, but fake meat, I don't know. I just have a hard time going after a fake meat company. Now it doesn't mean that a secondary setup I might, Take it, because if I have the mother of all secondary setups, then I might be willing to take it, even if it's something stupid like fake meat. But for these pioneer setups, I've sort of, I'm a little bit more, what's the word, skeptical. All right, beyond meat, I'm gonna have to track some of that down. It just does, I just, how can you make a beet taste like meat?
All right, let's take a look at uh, the question from Charles is MIST. I am long this stock. You know, this is kind of dovetails in nicely with my fear of missing out because you guys were talking about in the Facebook group. It is a little thin or a lot thin. And that's one of the tricky things with IPOs. Uh, this morning I went to place an order on one and it had a really big spread. So I watched it for a little while and the spread began to narrow. And I said, okay, I think if I trigger in, the spread will probably be narrow. That'd mean like an uptick in price. So that would be an uptick in activity. So I went ahead and took the order. But yeah, sometimes the spread can be really crappy on these things, especially when they're really thin like this. But I did like this one because one, it had okay range, not fantastic range, but okay range because it was down here towards 15 and then it rallied up to 18 and change, okay? So I thought it was worth a shot. In an ideal world, I would have liked this close to be a little higher, but it was tricky because it was a big spread and that spread didn't narrow too much until right around the close. So it was tough to make that go or no go decision. I don't wanna make it look like it's always cut and dry and super easy when trading these pioneer IPO setups. Yes, if you've got a thick IPO like Pinterest or something and you got a nice little pullback, it's pretty much cut and dry. You could just trade like you trade the core methodology, provided of course you understand the core methodology, which is pretty much pullbacks, okay? And a few transitional patterns here and there. Anyway, yeah, this triggered yesterday. I still think it looks kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if TC will give me the moving average today or tomorrow. But technically, if you added up these five days and put the moving average in here, then it could actually be a buy on today's close based on that moving average system. So, yeah, I think it's a buy. I think it's worth buying. Uh, maybe I'm just talking about position, but it's super thin, and I would be really careful. Make sure the spread is there. Coke, low volume, high priced, but do these work, pull, the pullback rules. Okay, let's take a look at that. Coke, Coke, okay. Well, this is obviously Coca-Cola. Um, interesting. Yeah, low volume, but it's $500, $300 a share. What's 300 times 66,000? That's that's fairly sizable, sizable. Why wouldn't Coke be bigger volume? Is that just one aspect? But yeah, I, I hear you've got a nice little accelerated uptrend. It's persistent. You got a TKO type of move. That looks okay. That's not bad. I think we traded. The technical analysis works at all price levels. I'm just more excited about going after something a little bit more exciting at lower levels before it gets up to four dollars a share. So, but yeah, absolutely, Harry. Huh. In for murder regarding the double tops. Gotcha. Missed the breakout on ZM. Well, here's another one of those high price IPOs where let's take a look at let's put a five-day moving average in and see what happens. So it would have to be, at, two things would have to happen. It had to be a new closing high, and it would have to be, so the buy would have been right there at 72 and change. But with something like this, I'm willing to let it go and take a secondary setup, okay? But yeah, technically, the low was greater than the moving average. Technically, it was a new closing high on this day here, okay? Although I... If even if I was trading it, I might have looked for a little bit more confirmation than that, especially the seventy something dollar stock. But yeah, mechanically or technically, however you want to look at it, this was a buy right here. And obviously so far so good. But you know, you had some ups and downs along the way, obviously. But yeah, the next pullback might be worthwhile. Yeah. It does it is kind of crazy. I thought Coke was KO. Well, sometimes these distributors, yeah, that's the beverage. That might be the distributors. Yeah, that's not, that other one wasn't even on, on my radar. It was so thin. That's probably, I'm guessing, distributors or something. I don't know. You guys can Google it and see. But yeah, good point, Brad. Lyft and Uber setting up for bear flags. Well, you're probably right, but the problem is it's hard to short. Can anybody check real quick if you could get shares to short on Lyft? But when an IPO is brand new, it's really hard to get shares to short. The only person that could short an IPO right out the gate would be like the market maker. And yeah, Lyft is another one of those turds. Let's take a look at Uber. This is actually surprising because I, I actually just wrote a column on what a turd it is. And look at that. It could actually close at a new closing high. I wouldn't call it a bear flag. But I certainly wouldn't rush out and, and buy Uber on a pioneer setup at this point in time. 
And by the way, for it to actually trigger a buy, I would actually have to close above this high. But you don't know beets. <laughs> Maybe I don't know beets. Do you pee red after you eat a lot of it? My wife had a friend for some reason. I think she was on some kind of diet or something where beets were like, make you lose weight. And she ate a boatload of beets. And she went to the emergency room and they're like, did you eat a lot of beets? <laughs> they poked and prodded her and did about a hundred tests and charged a thousand bucks. Yes, TPTX, I actually have a resting order in place on this one. Super, 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 super thin. Beginning to question my sanity on that. But yeah, I like it. Nice thrust high, nice little pullback. Could trigger in pretty soon, okay? So yeah, good eye on that one, John. But a little bit thin, a lot of it thin. And that's the one or one of the ones where I was looking at the spread and I decided at first to pull my order. I'm sorry, not place my water in this. Then the spread tightened up and I said, well, it's worth a shot, maybe. Again, I have a little bit of FOMO sometimes. Okay, NM is having a bow tie off of all time lows, or about a two year period. Hybrid shipping stock. Yeah, I'm not, I guess uh, Charles knows me because he's been around for a while. Uh, I'm just not a big fan of shippers. Years ago, I did some mechanical testing. Every now and then I'll do some mechanical testing, but. Many, many years ago, that's all I did for the first two to four or five hours a day and two, four or five hours a night. But now I, I, I do hand test some things every now and then, like the TFM system. But I'm not a big fan of mechanically testing things. But, but you can learn a lot. Research is research, and sometimes it'll throw off something. By the way, I'm reading, rereading Linda's book, Linda Rasky's book. First time I read it for content and grammar and flow and things like that and it wasn't I really enjoyed it but it was like it was a little bit more intense because I didn't want to let Linda down and now that nobody's depending on me for my opinion I'm able to reread it and really enjoy it anyway long story endless one thing she pointed out is 95 percent of your research ends up in the trash can and that's pretty accurate so but long story endless again the thing that I did find out by complete accident was I was doing some testing on sector analysis and knowing me it had something to do with relative strength and trend following. And it worked pretty well in most sectors, but in shipping, it failed miserably. And I think education stocks too, but that's such a small area. It's hard to really, you don't really have a representative sample there, but yeah, shippers tend to be wide and loose and all over the place. And this is kind of exhibit A. So what is the question? And it was having a bow tie off of all time lows, about a two year period. However, is a shipping stock your thoughts? Okay, let's take a look at that. So let's put the bow ties in so we can take a look at that. Yeah, technically you had a bow tie here and begin to take off. It did have a mountain of overhead supply to deal with. Okay. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Dave, if the market doubled and hit that overhead supply, is that really that big of a deal? Wouldn't you be happy? Yeah, I would. It's just these shippers, I have to really just unbelievably love them to go after them. If this was like a one-year base down here and then it bow tied, I might go after it. It's a little bit on the thin side, all things considered. I think I would pass for now. Yeah, it just kind of I tried to take off, came back in. I don't know. I just can't get excited about that. Look at Zoom people, look it for the real ZM. Look at Zoom people, took it for the real ZM. Look at Zoom. What are you saying? I'm confused. There's a stock that's not Zoom. Zoom video. Why is, what, anybody knows what this company does? So somebody, somebody thought somebody, there's another company named Zoom. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, this happens. I mean, people are stupid. But yeah, I mean, that's a, Zoom is not in TC. Oh, so somebody thought it was Zoom. They're getting it cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Puts. You would use puts on what, John? CPG, is that uh, weed? No, that's, uh, what am I thinking of? CMG? CGC is weed. We'll take a look at that too. Yeah, I don't mind these commodity stocks when they bottom out like this. You know, overhead supply, again, that's a long ways away. I would prefer, instead of it being, I prefer like a 10 month base or, or six or eight month base, I should say. And it, it looks okay. It broke out, came all the way back to its base. I'd almost rather see this one go down and consolidate. And then take off again. But as you know, because you're on a service, this was on this was on my watch list for a while, but I decided to take it off because it came back in. Long at four. 
Okay. Well, just honor your stop. Zoom went from a penny stock to $2. Oh, gotcha. And it's not even zoom. Lift puts if it triggers sharp below today's low. Oh, they, they were, uh, I don't want to Let's take a look at that. Lift has options. According to TC, it doesn't, but you would use puts. Well, let me walk over to another screen and see. I'll be darned. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, see, this is part of the mastermind group. Okay. And John's in the mastermind group, so that's why I got it from John. All right. Well, good. Now I know to walk over to my trade station if there's something new like this, big and thick, to see if they have options. So I can't imagine that the, the options will be, you know, not that you want to use the Black Shoals or whatever, but I can't imagine that the options will be cheap and something like this. But interesting. Thank you. Deep in the money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. So what he's saying is go deep in the money and that gets off the fluff, okay? The fluff is also known as extrinsic value. July 65s. Yeah, I hear you. And, you know, I wouldn't want to short a stock like this, even if you could get the shares, because God knows what could happen. But puts are a little bit different uh, situation. Oh, you look at the bailing on CPG. All right, 1415. Um... Well, if you're in, I wouldn't just bail out now. Maybe have a stop down in this base, okay? I mean, HV is pretty high on this stock, even though it seems like a big, wide stock, 25% low level. Low price stocks like this, sometimes you end up with a much bigger uh, stop percentage-wise, and that's okay. Now, just have a stop somewhere. Your life gets a lot easier because you're letting that market make the decision for you and you're not making that active decision. Let's say you get out now and you say, okay, well, I got out unscathed and then you come in tomorrow and it's 450, then 5, then 550, then 6, and so on and so forth. You're going to be a real hurt and pop. Obviously, the trade off is it could gap against you if you stay with it. But for me, I like to just put in a stop and forget about it. You're selling half. I, you know, that's just, that's fine. But if you make a mistake, that's fine. Go If you make a mistake in something and you truly make a mistake, buy the wrong symbol or fat finger or something, whatever, or have the wrong entry and you end up with something, then, yeah, there's nothing wrong with lightening up. But if you get into a position, I'm kind of in for a penny, in for a pound kind of guy. If you made the decision going into the trade, then just see that to its fruition is what I would recommend. All right. Anyone, any other questions? Well, while we're in an impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. A good crowd this week, Wyatt, so thank you. And, again, you could shoot me a question. Ideally, you want to enter it through the contact form on my website or, even better, through the members area. And then questions requiring a lot of thought, I will put together some slides and come in a Q&A session. If you're not a member of the q and I'm sorry, if you're not a member of GOLD, then what I'll do is I'll give you a free trial, which, by the way, there was an, a, an issue with the trials, with that, which I resolved. It's something like a bow tie in MU. I prefer this coming off of like all time highs, like back here, where you're at all time highs or multi year highs, as opposed to at lower levels. Okay. So I don't think I would take a trade in that. John Ross. Okay. Oh, John's going to look like a shill. IPO course is just as relevant as when it first came out. It's one of the best courses out there, worth every pity. Going to it, going through it for the third time now. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Can I quote you on that? I'm gonna have to. Um, I don't know if I can copy that. Definitely want to quote you on that, if you don't mind. Aaron says, "Great show." Hey, Aaron, my neighbor over in Mississippi. Do I have any interest in the big thick Momo stocks? They come up on my screens. You know, usually they're lower and volatility but there are cases where they could be worthwhile for sure can market make a see stop words not to my knowledge when using a hard stop do they play games to deliberately hit them the answer to the first part of the question is not to my knowledge the answer to the second part of the question as we say in fargo you betcha okay tko that's like a stop hunt there's all kinds of games that are played as far as i know if you place a hard stop with a brokerage that is an electronic order, and market makers cannot see them, but they will go after them, okay? Yeah, a lot of fun and games that happen. Okta, ZS, and now. Yeah, Okta was one from a long time ago, I remember. 
yeah, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with a stock like this. I'm just more excited about them further back in time. What happens is once a stock gets this high up, it it's sort of priced for perfection. I don't see a whole lot of clean entries going back in time. But yeah, sometimes these momentum stocks develop and they don't give you a whole lot of clean entries. And it isn't always a straight route higher. But yeah, this certainly could set up. My physical therapist is long this stock and it just keeps going up. <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> maybe I should learn from you. ZS and now, those are your examples. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that and on most of these, you've got pretty good HV. Now, this one here is kind of wide and loose in trades and chunks. So you had this big chunk, probably on earnings or something. And then you had this big chunk. So that would be kind of hard to trade. But I hear you. Technical analysis, technical analysis. But, you know, getting back to like the Ulta, something like that is priced for perfection. And now it's got a lot of volume. So it's well watched and you probably got a boatload of analysts on top of it, whatever. So it will become efficient in time. And it also will likely be priced for perfection if something bad happens. <laughs> yeah, I know, John, you're already on the website. Did Taint pull back too far? Oh, it's T-A-I-T, not Taint, Tate. Nope. Got to keep this show PG-13, T-A-I-T. <laughs> well, first of all, I've been watching this one just because it's fun to watch. But the HV is 130, and the first thing I see when I see a stock like this is it went from 3 to over 7, 100 and something percent run. And then if you look at the big run overall, 3 or 4 or 500 percent run over a short period of time. So I think it's too dangerous. But believe it or not, on something that shoots higher, I actually like a really, 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 really deep pullback like this. So to answer your question, no, it did not pull back too far. But I think it's just too wild and crazy to go after. More so on NASDAQ than on NYS. E which stops. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, it's one thing that, that I don't actually know. Um, I know there's a lot of fun and games that are played, and I've heard a lot of people, like, sometimes there's a lot of order entry systems that might have a huge order, and they, they break them up into hundreds of little chunks. It's like, um, you know, a thousand, a thousand offered, and that offer gets taken, and then a thousand offered pops right back up. So there's a lot of, there's all kinds of fun and games. I think you'd make yourself crazy. You try to figure it all out. As long as your stops are outside of the normal volatility and you maybe have some other technical analysis involved, pick the best, leave the rest, all the other good stuff, then you just sort of have to let the chips fall where they may. There was a client, I don't know if he was a client, it was just some guy who was emailing the crap out of me. And he would email me three and four and five page diatribes about how markets are manipulated. And, you know, let's say it took him two hours to put together that email or even 45 minutes. He could have spent 45 minutes looking at his charts for the next opportunity. But instead, he was focused on how they're out to get him. Well, everybody's out to get you in this effing business, okay? <laughs> you get over it, you know, and, and, and don't stress over that. But use that, turn that negative, you know, turn the frown upside down, you know. <laughs> use that negative energy towards something positive like finding the next big setup. All right. Anything else? Again, thanks everybody. Uh, any unanswered questions, submit it through the Q&A system and we'll cover it for the next question and answer session next week, next Wednesday. If it requires a lot of thought, if it's a quick answer, then we'll just cover it a week in charts. All right. Everybody have a great weekend and we'll talk between now and then. Thanks so much.